ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸਾ ਸੰਗਤ ਯੂ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਅਨਦਰ ਐਪੀਸੋਡ ਆਫ ਆਲ ਕੋਲਮ ਬੀਯੰਡ ਐਂਡ ਆਮ ਆਮ ਡਿਲਾਈਟਡ ਟੂ ਟੂ ਸੇ ਟੂਡੇ ਆਮ ਜੁਆਇਨਡ ਬਾਈ ਆਉਨੀ ਅ ਫੀਮੇਲ ਇਨ ਰਿਕਵਰੀ ਐਂਡ ਆਉਨੀ ਫਰਮ ਲੈਸਟਰ ਆਮ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਇੰਟਰੋਡਿਊਸ ਆਉਨੀ ਨਾਓ ਸਟ੍ਰੇਟ ਅਵੇ ਐਂਡ ਆਉਨੀਸ ਗੋਟ ਅ ਰੀਅਲੀ ਪਾਵਰਫੁਲ ਐਂਡ ਅ ਵੈਰੀ ਹਾਰਟ ਬ੍ਰੇਕਿੰਗ ਜਰਨੀ ਐਸ ਵੈਲ ਟੂ ਟਾਕ ਟੂ ਅਸ ਅਬਾਊਟ ਸੋ I mean, I'm not going to waste any time. I want to first of all thank you for joining us today on the Seat Channel and um you know in sharing your your story with us your journey um of addiction and um of trauma as well with us. Um so Annie gone I'm going to let you fire away and let's let's start from the beginning. Um where it all started for Annie uh, and the addiction to alcohol uh, and some of the uh, challenges you had in your life. So the my i'll be honest with you my alcohol usage was became a secondary problem to a primary issue i had suffered a lot of traumas in my life especially they all stemmed pretty much from childhood so with my mother she was um she had a traumatic childhood which she never dealt with herself she's only just dealing with now so that impacted the way that she was able to mother me and i was always being compared i was always made to feel like i wasn't good enough um my mother suffered a lot of mental breakdown so then I, the, we had a role reversal where i be, essentially became the adult and she became the child and then i was sexually abused by my dad's brother um between the 5 and 8 i came out with that when i was 13 years old but my dad's brother is married to my mom's sister so as you can imagine that caused all sorts of like problems and it was sort of like why didn't you come out with this before they got married um are you sure it wasn't just a phase um are you sure it wasn't just a dream you know and all these all these things and then eventually it was almost like okay it's happened now okay put it under the carpet and move on well life doesn't work like that you know and um i wanted to take it to court when i was 13 cuz my mom did take it to the, and the doctors obviously got the social services involved and as much as i wanted to say yes i was pressured into saying no um and back then i was really angry at my mom don't get me wrong but looking back now she was one woman and she had my whole dad's family not believing it or believing it and not really taking any notice of it my mom's family believing it but telling her don't allow don't allow her to take it to court so there was a lot of pressure on my dad actually my dad didn't do anything to be honest with you i remember when i um told him about the abuse and literally just sat there like i told him i went to the shop and so then i told him in a more graphic detail i think i told him not to get a response from him but i i did and then when i was 19 years old um <clears throat> i finally said to me okay anna you can take it to court now and i said to her are you sure she said yes her husband had cheated on her this is my dad's brother had cheated on her but i'll be honest with you she just used that as a I call it like a pack so that she had control to try to get him back because two weeks before the actual court case she got back with him she retracted her statement I also had a joint court case with my cousin her daughter so she at the beginning she was saying oh yeah he's done it to my cousin as well so then the police built up a case where they put our cases as a joint case and obviously her statement changed and it I, you know what I I I had built up so much resentment against my aunt and because I thought to myself of all the things you could have done to me of all the things you used me through a court case I had to sit stand in court and recount everything that had happened just so you could get him back that's the day I like completely lost, lost respect or lost any sort of empathy or anything for my aunt to be honest with you because that I can't understand I can't understand how you can be so evil So at that point I was quite broken um as you can imagine and then I met somebody now looking back now he wasn't right from the beginning he had a lot of issues um we just went a good fit and had I not experienced the traumas that I'd experienced had I not felt like I was enough had I not felt that I wasn't listened to had I not felt that I didn't get the response that I should have got um from my family I probably would have met him a little while and said goodbye but it didn't work out that way because when i told him about the abuse he gave me the reaction that i wanted from my parents he gave me anger he showed he was like you know showing me all 
he's a man how you know he it's like he felt for me and that's what i was looking for but not from him obviously and when he gave me that i clung on to that and that ended up being a very big mistake because i ended up in a very domestically violent relationship not saying i met him and the next day he hit me because that doesn't work like that you know i met him he had a, he had a temper it started off with his words then it escalated a few years later chucking stuff then smashing doors and eventually leading on to him putting his hands on me now someone might turn around and say annie why didn't you leave i didn't leave because i loved him i didn't leave because it's it's a slowly it's a slow grooming you don't realize it's happening it becomes reality and every day you're thinking it's going to change my alcohol usage came in at the age of 24 and i can really pinpoint that time because before that time alcohol hadn't been a problem i was able to use alcohol socially sensibly enjoy it leave it but at the age of 24 i be- i had my daughter um i became i moved out obviously i moved with him i became very isolated it was a very toxic relationship um i'd I fell pregnant in my first year of university with my daughter. So I took a year out. I went to uni in my second year at De Montfort in Leicester. Um, things started to go horribly wrong between me and him, but I passed my second year. I got into my third year of university and it just became a process where he was breaking up with me every other week. And, you know, I had exams, I had a dissertation to write and it just got all too much for me, to be honest with you. And then my auntie was going on with, you know, with my uncle and it, you know, that was very much still a part of my life. And I, I guess I just couldn't handle it. So I spoke to the uni and said, look, I would rather stop uni now before I carry on and then end up with a third class degree. I wasn't willing to get a third or anything below that. Um, so after I left uni, I really pretty much had nothing. It was just me and my daughter in this toxic relationship. And I guess I had time to think about all the things that were happening and going on in my life that had been... And I, I actually, I just couldn't cope with them. So I used alcohol as a self-medicating tool. It's cheap. It did exactly what I wanted it to do. And it be, and that became, and I used to binge drink. So it became a, 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 a habit of mine. I wonder, a habit, a process. You know, every time something was, goes wrong. Was, so you, 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 I think in, you talk at 13, from the abuse with your uncle. Yeah. And then. And 19, when your mother allows you to take it to court? It was my aunt, yeah. My aunt said, aunt, yeah. Aunt, sorry, my aunt allowed you to, to pursue it in the courts. And then at 24, um, your relationship, when you, you're having your first daughter. So there's quite a, a bit of a time span, isn't there? And then it, then you your relationship with alcohol develops when you're 24 and you start cushioning that pain that you've, yeah. through that trauma, you're using that as a as a tool really to cushion that pain the alcohol yeah definitely because i'd had a few I'd unsuccessful suicide attempts when in my mm-hmm. um teenage years you know so the, there was a lot there was a lot of deep rooted pain there that i'd never dealt with I'd, I'd never dealt with it you know i tried to go on life as normal but life how can it be normal because there was so much going on inside me um like I said, I, I tried to kill myself because I hated myself that much. I hated life that much. Um, f- and with the domestic violence as well, like the, the mental abuse, to being told I'm not good enough, I'm not a good enough partner, I'm not a good enough my daughter, constantly being compared to what I should be, being told what, who I should be, what I should be saying, where, where I should be in my life and where I actually am. And, you know, I just wanted it to stop, to be honest with you. And, and I, Annie, were you drawing parallels with this, with being in this relationship? with how you was brought up as a child as well. What you could do, what you can't do, and how you should be. Well, yeah, because it was it was a message that was initiated as a child and it was only it was reinforced by my partner. So this started as a child, you know, my mom well, I said my mom didn't deal with her. She hadn't never dealt with her traumas. So what other people thought was always important to her. I was I was quite an active child. People say to us, I was hyperactive. I wasn't hyperactive. I was just a child that loved to be in my own world. I loved to be in my own mind and play in my own, my own imagination, you know, but they would make her feel bad for it. And she'd take that out on me. She would compare me to my cousin saying, you know, she can read, why can't you? I remember at six when I couldn't read a card fully, a birthday card, and, you know, she strangled me because of it. It, it, was, it was that kind of severity at times. And... and it was always being compared, always being said, you're here and, you know, they're up here. 
And then the same message with my partner, you're here. I'm here, you're here. You know, and when something is reinforced like that to you, you end up believing it. You end up believing that you're not good enough. You end up believing that you're not worthy. It becomes so deep rooted that even when that person leaves your life, that stays with you because you because you believe it now, you know. And what did the alcohol do? You know, and how did that progress in, in becoming the addiction? The alcohol just numbed me to everything. You know, I didn't care. Like, with the alcohol, alcohol, I didn't think about any of these things. You know, at first, when I drank the alcohol self-medicating tool, I don't want to say it was all right, but, like, I would have a binge for a day or two and, you know, then I'd be able to, like, stop. It was more sort of binge drinking at that point. But I'll be honest with you, as the years went on, the binges got longer and longer. To the point I didn't want to call them binges anymore. You know, who has binges for, like, three weeks? But I did. You know, and then I would like try to stop because I had, you know, I, I, it wasn't that I was jobless this whole time. But I, did, I did get a job eventually like in a laboratory. And I suppose in a sense that was that should have been a point where I should have thought to myself, oh, my God, Annie, look, you've been told all these things. And look what profession, professional job you've been able to get yourself into. But that's that, that's that's the power of not not being healed. It doesn't matter what you've got around you. It's what you think inside you and what you believe inside you. you know? And it was also a case where I was always, you know, I would try to look the part. Even on a weekend, I'd be up, dressed by 10 o'clock, get up and dressed by 10 o'clock. Nowhere to go. What was I even proving a point to? I tell you what, I, was, I understand it now. I, I was trying to look at the part, this, this picture perfect part, because my life, I wasn't in control of my life. Whereas now... I literally am jamming in my pajamas all day, and it's okay because my life's on check. You know, my life's on track. So the uh, the alcohol was just pretty, it was a mask and a disguise, wasn't it? It was almost like a mask and a disguise. Yeah, and all what happened was uh, the more I used it as a self medicating tool, it became autopilot. Like mm. if some if I got upset about something, or if so, if someone because um, I'm a very emotional person person, sorry, and I'm a very overthinker. That's my that's my downfall. I've used that in a positive way in my recovery. But before I knew how to do that, I use it very much against me to the point where I'm thinking, overthinking. And then, you know, you, you know, you, you go from one thing to like a thousand things. And um, alcohol just stopped that. Alcohol stopped all the thoughts. Alcohol let me sleep. I thought I was sleeping. Obviously, you're not sleeping very well. But it, it just it just numbed me to everything. And at that time, that's what I wanted. But as I said to you, as the years went on and the more it became autopilot, I found myself going to the shop even before I knew what I was doing. You know, mm. until it got to a point in 2019. Because if someone's going to say to me, Annie, did you know, by my by the age of about 28, 29, did I know alcohol was a problem? Yeah, deep down, I did know it was a problem. I did know. But, you know, I was maybe in denial, trying, trying yeah. to think, oh, no, no, you know, I, I could change this round, this round, you know. But Was that because now, of the feeling, Annie, was that because of the feeling it gave you? And how it made you feel you know you talked about you talked about when you was a child you like to get lost in your imaginary world yeah and i know from my experience i could get when i was getting drunk um i could get lost in my world of alcohol and just forget everything no matter how serious the problem was it just well, doesn't definitely. It, it, it was just me in that bottle at that time mm, i felt yeah. like it sounds ridiculous but i felt like that bottle was my best friend best friend I mean, in the whole world and it doesn't sound ridiculous because you sound just like me and we've had a conversation before we've met and um, this is what uh, kind of drew me to you because your story just mirrors mine you know it, it, with the relationship with the alcohol so it doesn't sound silly i, I totally get what you're saying yeah like it, it, it was like the alcohol was a person and this person oh. that was the alcohol understood me was there for me didn't judge me you know it, it, it numbed me to everything like it was my best friend and I developed a relationship with alcohol to the point where I loved alcohol so much that it overruled, overruled my own life. You know, alcohol came before my, my life, before my children, before my family, you know, but ultimately alcohol came before me. That's the love I had for alcohol at, at, at my very worst, I would say. And you, you talk of 2019, and I know, Andy, when we spoke, um... And since we've been doing Alcohol and Beyond, we've had a lot of families phone the Seek channel for support, 
for help, guidance, and some just do not know which way to turn and they just want to know what to do. Some don't even know that they can go to the GP and talk about this. And, and this is addicts as well as family members who are just at their um, wit's end. Um, I know your mum, I think, I believe your mum phoned the Seek channel. Your mum phoned the Seek mm -hmm. channel, she got in touch. And, you know, and it, it really warms our heart here at the Seek channel, knowing that this is, was your first point of contact, uh, the Seek channel. And I spoke to your mum. We introduced her yes. to some services in Leicester. And, and you are here today to tell your story. It's, it's really amazing to, to hear your story and to be, for you to join us. And, uh, and this is where your journey began. Yeah, definitely. But I'll be very honest with you. It wasn't easy for my mum. Um, and I and I think that there is such a lack of information around substance misuse, it, just in terms of people actually don't know where to where to go. People don't know what turning point. You know, I have people reaching out to me on my Facebook because I'm be, I've become quite open about my addiction now on Facebook. It's coming. You now I'll be a year clean next year, next month, well done. next month, eighth mm. of April, next year. Um, you know, I get a lot of people reaching out, and it, and it shocks me that you know they they don't actually they no no don't know about these services. Also, my mum was up against a battle. She was a battle because the problem was, not only did I have a substance misuse problem, I had a mental health problem too. Well, unfortunately, they say to you, your mental health problem is due to your your alcoholism. That's not the case. The alcoholism is due to the mental health. And that's, that's a battle I was facing. I wasn't able to, in the end, my mum pushed and pushed to the point I was able to get a psychiatrist, you know, and I was able to get diagnosed and, you know, she she was, I think, I don't know how she got in touch with Manjit back in, how she got in touch with you, but I know that she was ringing the GP every single day. And I remember at one stage she was said to the GP, if my daughter dies, it's, it's down to you. Because they really are not as forthcoming with the help and support. You know, you're reaching out and it's almost like you're having to battle to get the help when you're already battling, you know. And I, and I think that there's a big flaw in the system somewhere. You know, thankfully for me, I had, I had my mum. I wasn't in, in a state or a condition to be ringing around getting support, you know, and I had that. But I'm aware that many, there's loads of people who don't have someone like my mum, you know. What happens to those how, people? How, so, you know, I mean, the Seek Channel has been doing this for five or six years now. And I know from the, the, the phone calls we have and the people that keep in touch with us as well, some of them want to re remain anonymous. And I'm really grateful and we're at the Seek Channel that you, you, you were willing to share your story today. And it gives a lot of hope not just to um, addicts, but other people as well, especially females in our community. So how yeah. important is, how important is the Seek channel and doing what they're doing in, in providing that hope for addicts and families and even people who've suffered traumas, um, it, it, you know, in childhood? I think it's absolutely imperative because it's the one, it's amongst m many other subjects, like, such as child sexual abuse, such as mental health. Mental health has been talked about a bit more, but, you know, Addiction is one of those things that is, in our Asian community, whether people want to admit it or not, is taboo. And especially oh. with Asian women, it does not happen. Well, sorry, it does happen. So I'm here. You know, and I think it's imperative that you guys, and I, you know, I, I'm in awe of you for bringing it to the forefront in, in, a, in a beautiful way that you have done. Because there is so many Asians. I think for, with Asian, Asians in addiction or, and families, we're not it's a bit different because as we know being asian comes with a lot of other um constraints and a lot of other you know um Packages. we have this need for this picture perfect you know image and mm. we, we're bound by so many rules and regulations that we make up ourselves in our culture but we're bound by them you know and it's so difficult and i think also that what i found people are very reluctant asians that have reached out to me they do when i say ring turning point they're reluctant to do that and i feel because the minute they they feel the minute they're in turning point or somewhere like that, they are classing themselves as an addict, and that's a shameful thing. And I turn around and say, actually, that's not a shameful thing. That's the bravest thing. So to have something like the Seat Recovery Network, where there's Asian people who have been there, there's families who have, you know, people in addiction. They, I suppose, that you're Asian people are able to able to identify more than just ringing up turning point. Because I know for a fact that, that so many Asians that I've spoken to, that's where it stops then. No, I don't want to ring turning point. I can do it on my own. And it, that's great. And, and Sasangaji, I want to just say that, um, you know, like I said, Aoni's um, mother contacted the Sikh channel 
we was able to help and you know and it's um it's really beautiful and that only can join us today and actually share that journey and be so open and honest about her traumas and how a relationship developed with um alcohol but you know it doesn't have to get to that point where you have to reach to where um Aoni did and there is services that people just do not know about we signposted um uh only two turning point in leicester but there's services all around the country that are delivering alcohol and drug services and the seek channel the seat recovery network are working with these uh, services now we're doing work with turning point in leicester and uh, only has become a peer mentor there she's working towards that and actually supporting other um not just females males as well so sasan you please continue um uh, ringing the the seek channel the seat recovery network and um you know for us um, it'd be a joy for you to come and share your journey with us as well how many um you you said that um phoning the seek channel and uh using accessing the services at turning point were quite um crucial in your recovery and what was the turning point for you in your recovery and uh, the rehab center you went to it wasn't just crucial it was i if if my mom hadn't got in touch with you if i hadn't been at turning point i'd be dead and that's the truth i'd be dead it oh. sounds like i'm maybe exaggerating i'm not exaggerating you know I, I had a choice to make at that point life or death you know my blood pressure was sky high i was drinking a liter and a half of raw vodka a day you know, i wasn't gonna live very long and um you say that again say that again how much about um, at the worst a liter and a half of raw vodka a day yeah wow uh, even i can't believe it when i'm saying it to you but wow. yeah you know and no, um I'll... carry on sorry no say what you're gonna say i was gonna say i was on elite and i thought that was bad so you as a female drinking a liter and a half some people won't be able to comprehend that no and you know the, the, like i said my blood pressure went so high and my high blood pressure became normal. I remember getting to hospital and they couldn't bring it down below 138 because I'm so, oh. I'm not saying I'm like the tiniest thing, but I'm quite, my stature is quite small. So to be, to be drinking that much um, alcohol and meat was a big, had a big effect. It was detrimental to my body. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Yeah, definitely. You know, you, know, you, you didn't go to um, a rehab center a treatment center that was for addictions did you so it was for addiction but it was oh, so addiction linked with it was a trauma informed trauma. rehab so it was for mm. addiction but the main focus of the rehab was on the traumas so you very okay. much there it was recognized that the addiction was a secondary problem to a primary issue uh -huh. and i think that was that was ideal for me because that's exactly what it was, you know, and in order to deal with the addiction, I had to deal with the, the traumas. Sure. I had to heal from the traumas before I could even start trying to hit, to deal with the addiction. Um, so only, I think with a lot of people in the Asian community, you know, when um, I know the, the families we've, even my own, my mum and my wife, they couldn't understand why I was drinking. When I look back at my life now, even childhood, I had traumas. There's traumas that I never yes. dealt with. I never, I, I didn't want to go there. And um, but a lot of people, you know, not just in the Asian community, in all communities, any community, won't recognise that traumas are um, something that actually turns us to something else. We, we find comfort in something else, and that usually is alcohol or drugs. Definitely, because they manifest. You know, you think oh. you left them in a box, but they're not. They're creeping out. They manifest themselves in. In different ways as i said it comes outside when you don't deal with something you think you think you're fine but actually it manifests itself in in ways you don't recognize at that time you know and especially with ptsd traumas what they what do they say about those they say they're not traumas that you can leave behind they're traumas that won't allow you to leave them behind so that, that you very much do have to heal from them so yeah you know and i i, I it's not surprising that people use substances to numb themselves from that that pain that great deep rooted pain and sadness because i feel very sad now when i look back at myself in addiction active addictions and the things i did and the, the states i got myself into and 
just looking back at the way I felt, I feel, I do feel a, a, a sense of, I feel so sad for that, that girl. Oh. Even though that girl Annie, to me. Yeah. Um, Annie, honestly, it's been a joy to have you on the Seek channel. And um, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us uh, and, and offering so much hope yeah. to other other people as well. And and it gives me joy as well to say that uh, Aoni has, uh, has, has become a volunteer for the Seek channel and the Seek Recovery Network and um, supporting us, support other, especially females who are struggling with alcohol addiction or drug addiction or even a trauma when they suffered in childhood. So Aoni, I really want to thank you for, for that and supporting us and um, sharing. And I'm pretty sure that we'll be speaking to you again soon. And um, like I said, thank you for your time. Can I just and, say uh, that once upon a time, it, this was a story that I was ashamed of. Yeah. Now it's a story that I'm proud to tell. And if I can help someone in my posi the position I was in, like that, I'd be so, you know, that'd be an honor. So thank you for having me. And like Jazz said, I'm here. So. No, brilliant. Sasenji, I'm sorry, we don't have much more time, but like I said, I'm pretty sure that we were speaking to Aoni again. And don't forget, this is where Aoni's journey started from the Seek channel and her parents were brave enough to phone and look where Aoni is today. She'll be celebrating one year in sobriety next month and I'm pretty sure that we'll be there. The Seek channel and the Seek Recovery Network will be celebrating with her. So Sasenji, till next time, Wahe Gurdjie Ka Khalsa, Wahe Gurdjie Ki Fateh.